like to call to order the August 18th, 2022 <laughs> meeting of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. This meeting is being streamed live and recorded as a public record. A recording of the meeting will be available at www.NorthCarolinaNCWildlife.org. As a courtesy to others, please turn off all cell phones during the meeting. And at this time, I'd call on Commissioner Ray Clifton to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by invocation, Commissioner Alexander. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Commissioner Alexander. Thank you, sir. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful world that you allow us to live in. In Genesis, you charged man with the responsibility to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all of the earth and over every animal that lives on earth. So Heavenly Father, we are thankful for our North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, a group of fine, dedicated people who through perseverance and hard work strive to protect and preserve the creatures and the plants that you have so bounteously graced our world with. These people work together, whether they, are, whether they are in an office, a laboratory, or in the field. And today, we want to thank you for the years that we were able to work with John Evans, a servant of wildlife who has decided to move on to other endeavors. Heavenly Father, we ask that you continue to lead us and to guide us as we do your work to protect your remarkable and very blessed world. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Commissioner Alexander. At this time, I'll call on uh, Margot Minkler for a roll call vote of present. Good morning. I'm going to do a roll call of commissioners present. Monty Crump. Here. Tommy Fumble. Here. David Hoyle. Here. John Coley. Wes Seegers. Mark Craig. Here. Tom Berry. Here. Brad Stanback. Here. Jim Ruffin. Here. Ray Clifton. Here. Kelly Davis. Here. Steve Windham. Here. Landon Zimmer. Here. John Stone. Here. Hayden Rogers. John Alexander. Here. Tom Hayslip. Here. J.C. Cole. And Mike Alford. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Margot. <clears throat> North Carolina General Statute 130A-15 mandates that the commission chair shall remind all commissioners of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest and appearances of conflict <laughs> under this chapter, and that the chair also inquires as to whether there is any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before the commission at this time. It is the duty of each commissioner who is aware of such personal conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict to notify the chairman of the same. At this time, I'll ask are there any recusals or declarations of conflict of interest on any items coming before the agenda from any commissioners this morning? Hearing none, we'll move forward. You all received minutes of the meeting that were distributed to you. Uh, uh, have you had a chance to review those? Any changes, additions, or corrections? If not, I'll entertain a motion and second for approval of Exhibit A. So moved. Motion. Second. Zimmer and Alexander. You get that? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> minutes are approved from the July 4th, 2022 meeting. Moving forward, I'll call on this time, call on uh, Dr. DP, DP Singler to provide a financial status report. Dr. Singler. Morning, everyone. Morning. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to present the Wildlife Commission financial status report as a um, as you can see, in general, from the total revenue was $104,983,972.13. million. Total expenditures was $105,530,655.26. Million. And the fund balance was $19,342,086.49. Million. The capital improvement fund, the revenue was $16,299,714.36. Million. Total expenditures were fifteen million three hundred four thousand three hundred ninety-seven thousand ninety-three. 
the fund balance was three million two hundred eighty one thousand eight hundred forty five dollars and eighty one. Endowment fund, the fund balance as of June uh, 2022 was $146,332,449.80. Allocation of uh, 41 second and 15 income and 59 <coughs> percent Income of 2019. Uh, this concludes the uh, commission's uh, financial status report as of June 30, 2022, and I'll be happy to answer any you might have. Thank you. Are there any com questions or comments of the financial status report from any of the commissioners? Hearing none, we'll move forward to committee reports. This time I recognize Vice Chair Ray Clifton of the Boating Safety Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Boating Safety Committee meet, met yesterday uh, at 9 a.m. Ms. Betsy Haywood, our no wake zone coordinator, reviewed eight rule, rule proposals. These included <clears throat> final approval of one temporary rule, final adoption for one permanent rule, and a request of notice for text of six proposed rules. Boat and Safety Committee endorsed all eight proposals adopted by the commission and later, later in this meeting with exhibits uh, N202P1 and P2QRST and U. And Mr. Chairman, our uh, Boat and Safety Committee adjourned with, uh, at, at 919. Thank you. Are there any <clears throat> comments or questions of Boat and Safety Committee report? Here none, we'll move forward to Rules Com Committee report. Uh, Vice Chair David Holt. Rules Committee took over at 920 promptly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the uh, first rule was hunting on game lands. No bill was introduced <clears throat> on this rule in the 2022 short session. So the rule will become effective August 23rd, which is the 31st legislative day. All 2022, 2023 annual cycle game land rules are scheduled to become <clears throat> effective October the 1st. For the 2023 long session, we currently have 48 rules subject to legislative review. These include the Bear Sanctuary and Jordan Game Land rules from the 2022-2023 annual rule cycle, and 46 inland fishing rules that were adopted to provide clarity to the regulation, to the regulated public <coughs> land game and non-game fishing regulations in the inland fishing waters and game fish requirements in coastal fishing waters. A temporary rule was adopted for Jordan game land that will be effective October 1 to ensure regulations are in place for the upcoming seasons. Finally, the emergency and temporary rule amendments prohibiting use of hunter harvested cervix excretions in surveillance areas were reviewed. The emergency rule will be presented for adoption at today's meeting and it is necessary to have restrictions in place before the hunting season. Temporary rulemaking must happen concurrently. Additionally, the required rule changes to NB 0201 from the session law regarding use and possession of deer excretion statewide were presented and will also be recommended for notice of text at today's meeting. And we adjourn. Are there any questions or comments? Chairman Hall from the Rules Committee. Here and then we'll move forward to Habitat Non-Game Endangered Species Committee report, of which uh, Chairman uh, Craig will have a report from the committee, and we expect a motion from the committee for the award of the Thomas Quay Wildlife Diversity Award. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Habitat Non-Game and Endangered Species Committee met yesterday at 10.15 a.m. Dr. Sarah Schweitzer presented information on the Henslow Sparrow and the Atlantic Pig Toe Conservation Plans, including comments received from the public. That'll be voted on later in today's meeting. Comments were overwhelmingly supportive and required no changes to the plans. Next, Dr. Schweitzer then presented the nomination packet, the expiring terms of the non-game wildlife advisory committee known as NWAC, membership which will also be presented for a vote today. Requests for reappointment and nominations for the public were solicited from February 28th through April 30th of this year. The committee received five very informative presentations beginning with Allison, Medford's presentation on how the commission is preparing for the potential passage of the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, known as RAWA. Rachel Hutch then provided an update on, safe, on the statewide safe harbor agreements and candidate conservation agreement with assurances, which is expected to post to the federal register soon. Next, Brenda Jones and T.R. Russ presented on efforts to raise 
restore and reintroduce the magnificent ram's horn snail and the Roanoke log perch. Finally, Sarah Finn presented on staff's works with volunteers to locate and count diamondback terrapins through multi-agency partnerships. The committee reviewed the ballots for the four final nominees for the Thomas L. Way, L. Quay Wildlife Diversity Award. The committee votes were tallied, and at this time, I would like to make a motion on the behalf of the committee to select Jean Beasley as a recipient of the 2022 Thomas L. Quay Wildlife Diversity Award. Okay, the commission has a motion on the floor by Chairman uh, Craig on the uh, award of the uh, Thomas Quay Wildlife Diversity Award recommendation. Is there a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Wyndham. Are there any other comments or questions? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to make this award of Thomas L. Quay signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you motion very much. Carried. Our meeting adjourned at 12 o'clock. That concludes our report. Thank you, Chairman. Craig. Land Acquisitions and Property Committee, Chairman Tom Berry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Land Acquisition and Property Committee met yesterday on the 17th for about 35 minutes. The committee reviewed and endorsed five phase ones as well as two phase two land acquisition projects. Cumulatively, the committee reviewed over 5,000 acres of land acquisition projects that will hopefully result in conservation ownership. We also uh, made note of this aggressive uh, land acquisition uh, effort that we uh, have been talking about for many months. We've just sent out a letter that uh, to these landowners and um, we hope to uh, generate some interest, pretty exciting. Together, these two, the phase ones and the phase two um, was 5,351 acres. Now we don't have a price on the below track, but there's an approximate price per acre of these 5,000 plus acres of $575 per acre. And these kind of results, I'm telling you, just don't happen. Uh, it's a result of staff uh, and our committee working together to reach out and turn down projects, accept projects. And then when we get the project, seek the right funding uh, sources that, um, I, and I didn't do the math, but we could, but I venture to say that probably out of PR funds or uh, state agency funding um, that probably <laughs> only half of this money that we're using, I'd say two or $300 per acre. So uh, that's a really exciting. <clears throat> and I just want to commend our staff really uh, for uh, weeding through the, the projects and bringing the right ones forward and seeking the right funding. So very proud of our staff. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that concludes our report. Thank you, Chairman Barry. Are there any questions or comments? <clears throat> Hearing none, I'll call on Landon Zimmerman, Chair of the Finance Committee for your report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Finance Audit and Compliance Committee met yesterday, August 17th. The uh, internal auditor, Steve Chase, presented changes to North Carolina General Statute 143-746, Internal Auditing Required, and 143-746, Council of Internal Auditing, to update the committee about additional monitoring and compliance requirements. Additional, additionally, WRC Internal Audit Key Performance Indicators were presented and discussed. Lastly, lastly, the fiscal year of 2023 WRC Internal Audit Plan was presented, and the plan consisted of three continuous monitoring projects, a review of the process flow for cooperative agreements and a compliance review of the IT file backup policy. Uh, after that, Chief Financial Officer Dr. D.P. Singla then presented a comparison between fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2021 for periods ending in June, highlighting both revenues and expenditures for the general and capital improvement funds. Staff was asked to add to this analysis and provide a comparison that includes the fiscal year 2020 data. And the committee also reviewed the balances and asset allocation of the endowment fund as of June, 2022. The committee discussed the ratio of equity compared to fixed assets and would like to further discuss that topic at the next committee meeting. The staff was also was tasked to add earning details in bond index fund and equity index fund for the endowment fund portfolio for the next meeting. And staff was also asked to provide information about forecasting future endowment funds needed at the October meeting. And that concludes my report. Are there any questions? That was a mouthful. That's good. Tongue twister. Uh, <laughs>
Are there any further questions or comments on the finance committee report? Here none, I'll move forward with the presentation of the committee of the whole report. The committee of the whole met yesterday at 2.30. The meeting began with the recognition of the upcoming retirement of Colonel John Edwards Evans and his remarkable career. Ashley Perkle then gave a presentation on 10 proposed emergency, temporary and permanent rules, which will be voted on later in this meeting. Next, Casey Phillips presented on the force optimization project that we have been working on for the last 10 years. This impressive project will provide a 50 year roadmap to managing the timber on WRC lands to first maximize wildlife benefit and secondly, optimize revenue. Christian Waters then presented the draft memorandum of agreement and maps that were negotiated between the chairman of the Wildlife Resources Commission and Marine Fisheries uh, Committee Commission on a motion by David Hall and a second by Tom Berry, the committee approved the draft memorandum of agreement and delineation of waters maps. Brad Howard quickly updated the committee on the location of the new CWD positive deer, which was approximately a half a mile from the original uh, prior positive uh, case. He also updated the committee on the ongoing outbreak <clears throat> of hemorrhagic disease in deer across the state. The committee then moved into closed session to discuss ongoing litigation. The committee returned from closed session and therefore being no further business, the meeting was adjourned at 420. Are there any questions or comment about the report from the committee to hold? Hearing none, we'll move forward and I'll call on Director Ingram for a special presentation or order of the Longleaf uh, Pine. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, commissioners and staff. Uh, special presentation again this morning is one of the most rewarding parts of my job is to be able to recognize outstanding employees and milestones for their careers and achievements with this agency. Uh, Gary Dale, who, who we've seen recently, uh, back again, is retiring August 31st with 46 years of service to the Wildlife Resources Commission. For that, and, and I'll repeat that, 46 years. For that entire 46 year span, he has worked to develop the agency's voting access program and contributed to making it to be recognized as the best voting access program in the country. This work takes place year round in every extreme of weather and the crews are on the road traveling away from home nearly every week. Many of Gary's projects have received awards from the state's organization of voting access or SOBO. <clears throat> in two weeks, Gary will be recognized individually by SOBA in Cleveland, Ohio at the 2022 SOBA Symposium with the 2022 Special Recognition Award for his years of innovation and dedication to voting access. Today, I have the pleasure of presenting Gary with the Order of the Longleaf Pine. Since 1963, North Carolina governors have reserved their highest honor, the Order of the Longleaf Pine Award for persons who have made significant contributions to the state and their communities through their exemplary service and exceptional accomplishments. Persons named to the order become North Carolina's ambassadors with their names and award dates recorded on a roster maintained by the Order of the Longleaf Pine Society. I present Gary with this certificate by which the governor confers upon the recipient the rank of ambassador of extraordinary <laughs> privilege to enjoy fully all rights granted to members of the exalted order among which is special privilege to pro propose the following North Carolina toast and selection company anywhere in the free world. Here's to the land of the Longleaf Pine, the summer land where the sun does shine, where the wheat grows strong and the strong grow great, Here's to down home, the old North state. Gary, congratulations and thank you for your exemplary service to the state of North Carolina and all of our constituents. Please come up. This time I recognize Gary Gardner, our uh, section chief for engineering to induce our speakers for the agency. Spotlight, boy, I mean, I'm, I'm, 
I'm one ahead. I'll call on Travis Casper for a check presentation from Davidson. Uh, thank you, Chairman Crump and Commissioners. Um, this has been probably over a year in the making. Um, we've had some setbacks due to COVID, but over about a year ago, we were contacted um, by Mr. Bill Bennett, who I'll have come up here, here in a second, who's a senior marketing director with Davidson's Guns. He had recognized, they have recognized, Davidson Guns have recognized the work that we were doing at our shooting ranges and wanted to donate some money to the agency to further that effort. So in talking with him, with um, Jamie Hall, our marketing director, and Gary Gardner from engineering, and talking with him, we quickly identified a project at Caswell um, that we could do some safety upgrades by upgrading a lighting system with a red and, red and blue lighting system that you'll see later on in our presentation. And this money was perfect for that. So we were able to take the donations from Davidson's Guns, put it with our PR funds, and be able to match match that money, put it with a 75-25 grant, and pretty much carry out that whole project, 80 or somewhere roughly around $80,000 project with minimal impact to our state funds. So um, we wanted to get Mr. Bennett up here, recognize the effort from Davidson's Guns and the donation that they had given our agency. So I'd like to call him up now. And we'll do a photo presentation later, but he donated, they donated us $10,000 and we were able to take that and further our range safety efforts out at Dave, uh, Campbell Community Lane. So thank you, sir. As Trasper noted, we'll break for a uh, photograph after the next presentation. And at this time, Gary Gardner, we will introduce our speaker to the agency spotlight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, commissioners. We appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to present this spotlight on our shooting range program today. We get a lot of questions on our range program, you know, how we select sites, how we design them, and how we operate them. So this will be co-presented by Josh Jernigan and Steve Bailey. Um, Josh is with the education division as our shooting range manager, so they operate everything. And then Steve Bailey is our engineer who's done all the design and construction for um, the last nine years on our shooting range program as we've built this up. So of course we don't have the long 75 plus year history you heard from enforcement last year, but we still have an important history and an important mission to our agency here. So I'd like to bring Steve and Josh up. Good morning. Thank you for having us here today. Again, uh, my name is Steve Bailey and uh, with the engineering division, and we're going to present our program today called Providing Access to Shooting Sports. We wanted to start with a little bit of the origin of the program when I began involved. Um, we had a couple of shooting ranges before this, uh, but about 10 years ago, target shooting was allowed in an informal arrangement on almost all the state-owned game lands. Um, it was around this time that the staff identified that this was becoming an issue at some of our sites. The photo here is a site that was used by a lot of folks for target practice at the Holly Shelter game land. And you can see some of the damage that's being caused to the trees here. So that was a resource problem for us. What you couldn't see here is that there are several residences about a quarter mile through the woods there. And you really didn't know they were there unless they started mowing their grass, and then you could hear them. So this was a safety issue as well as a resource issue. Um, and we identified that if we could build some shooting ranges, give folks a place to go shoot safely, uh, we could have a little bit better control over it and uh, contain that, allow us to recover the lead after the shooting, and also provide some outreach uh, to our users. This is a map of our current ranges and one range that is planned for construction. Um, the four ranges uh, in the furthest western mountains that are light green, those are on U.S. Forest Service property and are managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, we have 13 ranges total. Six are managed by WRC staff, and we have three ranges that are managed by county partners. Um, and the one range that is shown on here that is still to be built is the Camp Haynes range up in Stokes County. 
Our goal for the program is to try to provide a shooting opportunity, a place for folks to have safe shooting opportunities within a reasonable distance anywhere in the state. So we're trying looking at a 50 to 60 mile radius. This map here in the darker tan is a 30 mile radius from each of our ranges and the lighter tan is a 50 mile radius. You can see we've got most of the state covered within a 50 mile radius, except for some areas on the coastal plain, primarily the no northern coastal plain and one area in the northwest corner of the mountains. Um, one thing the commission has done is once we've provided these public shooting opportunities, you have closed uh, the game lands in those areas to target practice. Right now, target shooting is prohibited on 36 different game lands. When someone brings a site to us, we have to do an evaluation to begin to look at it and say, is this a, uh, would this be a feasible site or a good site to put a shooting range on? Um, some of the things we look at, how much land is available, what constraints are on the land, uh, the surrounding uses, such as if there are neighbors close by or schools or anything like that. We'll also consider what kind of partnership opportunities we may have to operate the ranges. The map here is a tool that we use to evaluate a piece of game land at one time in the past to see if it would be suitable to pursue. The game land is shaded in the green. Um, if you see the red dots around, those are all residences around the game land. And then the red lines are a half mile buffer from those uh, residences. And then within the shaded green, you see some hatched areas. Those are all stream buffers. So areas that we'd want to stay away from. So this turned out to be a site that was not very faithful. It just didn't have a lot of land that was far enough away from the houses that uh, was something we wanted to pursue. When we evaluate the sites, we usually do two formal studies. One of those is a sound study. Um, we'll look at it, often we'll do staff first and then we'll have a consultant do that if the staff evaluation looks good. Generally, we look to have a half mile, at least a half mile distance from the range to an existing residence to try not be a nuisance. That can vary depending on topography and vegetation around the sites. Um, if the sound study looks good to us, we'll proceed with an environmental assessment of the site, that done by a consultant as well. And then we'll schedule a public information meeting where we can present the findings of both of these studies, the sound study and the environmental assessment to the public and get their input on the site to see if it's something that the community would support and uh, would want to go forward with it. And that's usually at the point uh, somewhere in here where it will be brought to the commission. Another question we get is how much land is needed for a site? And that kind of gets the age old answer, it depends. And one thing it depends on is what you want to include on the site, what type of facilities we want to have, because uh, rifle and pistol ranges have a little bit different requirement than a shotgun range. It also depends on the characteristics of the property. You know, is it, are there a lot of wetlands or streams on the site? Um, are there other top topographical issues that would uh, present a problem or something we have to work around? And pictured here is an overall map of the Foothills shooting complex that we worked with, with uh, Cleveland County. It's probably the biggest site that we have. You can see it's a lot of different amenities, but it's also kind of spread out on this piece of property because there was a uh, pretty good sized creek that went right through the middle of the site. So the design had to be worked around that as well as a railroad on one side of it. And just off, well, actually going through the site was a large power line as well. When I first began working with the shooting range program, uh, <clears throat> we were looking at unmanned sites, basically target site insights was kind of the idea or our vision that we thought we were gonna get. So we were looking at smaller sites, pretty simple, basic, just give folks a place to come shoot with a couple of benches. We provided a covered area to keep them dry if, and keep the sun off of them. Over time, we found out we had a lot more usage than what we were expecting and we had a lot of recreational usage. So our designs had to evolve with that. Uh, pictured here is the Odom facility uh, about the time it was open. Some of the changes we had to make were changes to actually how the structures were built because we were finding that folks were actually shooting the front of the shelters. So we had to change, switch them around so we didn't have any load bearing members where they could hit them. We began to add baffles to increase our safety. We also had to allow for more maintenance access and we did a lot of things for uh, control with fencing and other ways to guide folks into the shelters to make it easier for our RSOs to control how folks move around the sites. 
We wanted to show you a little bit about how the baffles work. Um, on the left is a photo, basically at a shooting position on the McDowell range, looking down where a target would be. And you can see overhead the baffle plates that restrict where if someone is to aim high, they would hit one of these plates. It basically extends the backstop up and provides additional safety to make sure that any rounds that are shot down range stay on the range. You can also see in the background of this picture, the black on the backstop there. Over time, we have switched over to using a ground rubber product on the face of the backstops. We found that that provides a, a better impact area and requires a lot less maintenance than the sand that we were using originally. And then on the right, that's a close up of one of the baffle plates on the Caswell range. And you can see the different uh, bullet splatters there from uh, individual impacts on those plates. Once we installed these, we found that they got uh, hit a little bit more than we realized that they would. <laughs> so they're doing what we wanted them to do. These photos are from a couple of our newer sites. Um, on the left, you can see the line that's painted on the floor. Um, we use that, the RSOs use that in their uh, operations. When the range goes cold, it, everyone has to stay behind that line, provides a little bit of a barrier to keep people away from the uh, shooting benches and where the firearms are and uh, gives them a, a definite place where people have to be. Um, you also can see a little bit in the ceiling there that there's some black panels. Um, that's an acoustic panel that we put in most of our shelters to help cut down on the noise and the reverberation to make it better for our safety officers as well as the users. In both of the photos, you can see the tubes in front of the benches. Um, that is something that we construct at our Dan River facility. We call them shoot tubes. They're basically like a big muffler for the rifles to cut down on some of the sound. And um, these are also some of the newer benches that we use that are adjustable for height and for side. They allow, if we have someone in a wheelchair, we can move them out of the way. They can use any lane they want to, as well as it's easier to clean up. We can adjust that seat if you're a tall person or a short person. It gives them a little bit more flexibility for how they can use the range and get comfortable. Those are some things that it, we initially built fixed benches and we got a lot of complaints because they never fit anybody exactly right. And so we're, we're actually retrofitting these now to be a better product for our users. When we began the range program, as again, I said, we were looking at unmanned sighting ranges. So we didn't provide facilities. We didn't provide an office space for any staff to be there. This was at the Flintlock range and we had a small building we put in that was primarily for storage, but it ended up becoming used for office space as well. We're trying to fix those over time. This is at the Holly Shelter facility. Uh, when Pender County agreed to help operate that for us, we put in this office facility and we had to do it relatively quickly. So we used a, a pre-manufactured unit. And this is a photo of the office facility that was recently constructed at the McDowell County range. Um, with this facility, we included some storage space on the left side, basically kind of like a garage where they could store their targets and do some target prep. And then the office is on the right-hand side <coughs> where they've got room to do their uh, safety videos and uh, bring in their new patrons and do their intake with them. <coughs> archery is another component we've integrated over time to our ranges. Um, this is the static archery range at the Odom facility. We have both static archery ranges and 3D courses at four of our facilities. The uh, Odom facility just has the static range and Caswell right now has a 3D archery course. Shotgun facilities are something else we've began to integrate at some of our places where we can. Uh, the Lentz facility has two skeet trap ranges and one five stand. Uh, Foothills now has two skeet trap ranges, one skeet range and one five stand field. We have plans uh, to build two five stands at uh, Holly Shelter, and we're taking a look at the Castle facility to see what we can do there as well. Some of the challenges with siting a shotgun range, or one of the primary challenges, is the area that's needed. Um, the NRA recommends a 300 yard safety zone downrange. For a skeet field, that ends up being about 32 acres. And so that can present some challenges, just finding property that works for that. You also, your lead reclamation is more difficult because that lead is scattered over a much larger area. And you have to look at, are there any environmental issues in that area that will present, prevent us from being able to reclaim it down the road? 
Um, also, yeah, ideally you want to orient your shotgun ranges to the north so you don't have such a, uh, as much of a sun glare issue, especially in the winter time. I mentioned lead reclamation. Um, this is a photo of a reclamation process at the Lentz facility that took place when we did the renovation recently. We reclaimed all the lead we could from the existing berms before we regraded the site. Pictured here is the lead um, that was recovered on pallets ready to be sent to a recycler. That was about eight and a half tons of lead that we removed from those berms. Um, we have been through most of our outdoor ranges now. So far with our program, we have recovered uh, over 90,000 pounds of lead. And we're targeting doing a lead reclamation process every five to eight years at each range. Um, that 90,000 pounds of lead works out to, we estimate it's at least five and a half million rounds that's been recovered. So I'm gonna turn it over to Josh now, let him talk a little bit about our operations. Hello everybody, I'm Josh Schoenig, I'm the shooting range manager. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our operations. Uh, so the purpose of our range is to foster safe and responsible shooting skills. Our mission is to <coughs> implement and provide education, competition, and access to shooting opportunities. Our vision is to make shooting range and shooting sports activities and education accessible to North Carolina citizens. Um, so I'm just gonna cover a little bit of the range numbers here. Uh, so this is from July 21 to July 22. So notably on here, if you can see, McDowell County has 344. Uh, this range recently opened in May, and that's the reason that one is so low. And the highest right now is Foothills Public Shooting Complex with a little over 19,000. Uh, this gives us a grand total of 58,154 participants that have been to our program this year. So how the ranges operate. So when you come to one of our facilities, you check in at the range, you speak with one of our range safety officers. Um, if it's your first time to the range, you watch a little range safety video, which you will see a preview of the new video shortly after this. Um, you'll get issued a range pass card. It's good for one year. The reason we do this is we always like to give a little refresh to everybody after a year. Um, you sign in on the tablets. Um, when you sign in on the tablets, what we gain is we gain a waiver and other data is collected from this. And then you go up to the ranges and you enjoy it. <clears throat> so some of the data that's collected that we're currently using, uh, so we do collect email addresses, name, zip code, and obviously the waiver. Uh, some of the specialized questions we're asking, you know, we ask people what they're shooting that day. We ask them if they have a hunting license or have held a hunting license before. And we're using all this information, working with the communications team to implement our marketing plan uh, through emails and so on and so forth. Oh, video. And I'm going to switch over for the video. It goes it says, right sir. That's right. I like instructions. You could be a commissioner. You'd be great. <laughs> and I would also like to add, so this is just a preview. Uh, so we lowered it. The video is about seven minutes long. And so we cut it down to about 2.30. So during the middle, it's explaining the hot cold procedures. Uh, we did a fast forward animation through that. So just give me a heads up on that. Welcome to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission's Public Shooting Range. This range is one of several across the state built to provide the public access to shooting sports and wildlife associated recreation. Today, we're going to review range safety guidelines to ensure you have a safe and enjoyable shooting experience.
Knowing the safety commands, proper procedures, and range safety rules are the first step in having a safe and enjoyable experience. As you visit the various Wildlife Commission shooting ranges, some locations may have additional facilities beyond a pistol or rifle range, such as Target or 3D Archery. a trap or skeet field, or five stand. An RSO will be available to assist you with additional information about these opportunities and review all range safety rules. Thank you for visiting this shooting range managed by the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, where your next adventure awaits. For more information, about Wildlife Commission shooting ranges, head to ncwildlife.org slash shooting ranges. <laughs> so this will be the video that everybody will see when they come to shoot our range for the first time. Um, do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. Evidently, the rangers don't provide anything like sleds or shooting bags or anything like that, do they? Uh, some ranges have had some donated, uh, so a few of them have some. But you would need to take all of your own stuff. Basically, just basically you've got a bench and, and, a, and a place to put a target, but obviously you have to bring your own targets. And when the range is cold, go down there and put them up. Is that how that works? Yes, sir. Thank you. And how, how long are they, 100-yard ranges? Uh, they're, they're all a little different. Uh, we have a standard for us is roughly 100, a 50, and a 25-yard range. Is the video available on the website to see? Oh, yes, sir, it will be. It will be. <laughs> when it's done. Yes, sir. So how many do we have under construction now? Uh, we do not have anything actually under construction right now. We've got some improvements underway. Uh, the campaigns range should have already been under construction, but we ran, we're having to do a redesign there because we ran into an issue with uh, something our partner didn't tell us about, uh, but we don't have anything actively under construction now since McDowell. It seems up. that they're getting harder and harder to get past whatever threshold we need to get in order to get them. It, it is hard to find, you know, we've, we've looked at a many areas. We've got one partnership down towards the coastal plain that uh, has a potential that we provided some concept drawings with the partner, our camp, with the county that owns the property, and they're working through some issues on that. Um, we've got a few other sites that have come up recently. Some people have brought to us. We've done some early evaluations on. Uh, we continue to do that whenever anything comes into us, but there are a lot of hurdles. I, I, one of the things I kind of had written down, but didn't say a lot of times we're looking for a unicorn of a site. We want something that's easy to get into where we don't have to build a lot of road or, or easy to access, but we also like something that's far away from anybody else. But we want to be near a population center so people use it. So it's kind of hard to find. <laughs> Funding, I'm assuming that it's all PR money. Yes, uh, sir. We predominantly, most everything we funded has been through PR dollars. Um, <laughs> the McDowell range we did recently, the county paid the match for that. Yeah. And right now our and PR dollars- paid a considerable amount. Yes, County, yes, yes. Foothills put in a considerable amount on theirs. Um, they're right now, our PR funding on shooting range projects are 90-10. So we have to have a 10% match and 90% PR dollars. Right. Okay. Thank you. A few years ago, we had a presentation on lead recovery, and I heard about the ballistic sand that mm -hmm. was being used. Mm -hmm. Has that changed? I thought I heard you mention there's a different... Backstop so we, we used, now. yes, when we originally started the project, we used something we call ballistic sand, which was basically sand mixed with some lime. And what we found over time is it would hold the slope really well for the first year to 18 months. And then you start to get some sliding and rains. And once we ever had to push it back up the hill, it didn't take much at all for it then to want to start sliding in again. And what, we, what happens is once that slides or that little first uh, couple of inches washes off, then you see all the bullets on the surface, they look like little pebbles. And that presents uh, some concerns sometimes for folks, whether you're gonna get any ricochets or something off of that. We've started using the ground rubber, which is basically, it's a, it's a metal free ground tire rubber. It's very similar to what you use, what you'll see sometimes on playgrounds, except for we buy unpainted 
we don't really, we don't care what color it is. So we just get the unpainted. So it looks a little gray. And we put that on and we found so far that it holds the slope really well. To my knowledge, we haven't had to really push any of that up. And what happens is then the bullets just kind of swallow into it and go in and they're not seen anymore. So we found it, it's a little more expensive up front, but it cuts down on our maintenance greatly. What about brass recovery? Do some shooters take that back to reload, but I assume there's still a lot of that. Yeah, we have collection buckets. Josh, you can help me on this, I think, but I think what our, we have collection buckets. So we ask people to pick up the brass um, and they can either take it back with them or they can basically put it in the brass containers um, for recycling. Um, it's kind of up to them, but we try to discourage, I think, scavenging. We don't want somebody going around trying to grab somebody else's brass. Um, I know the uh, Foothills facility at one point, I haven't talked to them about recently, but they were actually able to, they were selling their brass that they collected to somebody that I think was reconditioning it. And uh, they were kind of using that as an additional revenue stream. Go to the, yes, sir. Uh, do you have, have to call to make reservations to any rangers or just show up? The, go ahead, Josh. Um, so the only range you have to have a reservation at currently is the White County Indoor Range. I um, mean, do all that online. All the other ranges, you can just show up. You say the White County Indoor Range. Yes, sir. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. A um, couple of questions. Do you guys, do we charge anywhere for uh, this or, or is it a free? It's free. So the WRC operated facilities are free, except for at the Lentz facility, we do charge if you use the uh, clays, the uh, either the ski trap or five sand, uh, right. they charge basically to recover the cost of the clays that are used. Um, our county uh, partnership ranges, we do allow them to charge a fee and they do. And it varies a little bit between there. And so basically they're, most of those, they're trying to recover the cost of the RSOs that they have man in them, but the WRC operated facilities, we don't charge for the pistol or rifle. Nice. Now that's a great program. And you can tell, I think having somebody there is a lot more helpful, you know, for a lot of, you know, for safety, for everything, but also the, um, are there any, any con privacy concerns with name people when, you know, when you're asking for their information? Uh, we currently have not ran into any no? issues. Good. Yes, ma'am. Um, what are the hours of, of operation? So they're all slightly different. We are hoping to move to more of a uniform schedule, but most of the ranges currently are operating on a Tuesday through Saturday schedule or a Wednesday through Sunday schedule. Is it, does, isn't it the Caswell game land that has a lot of people from Virginia that utilize the range? Yes, sir. Is there any Oh, to requiring them to have a North Carolina hunting license to have access. Camp, yes, Commissioner Stone. Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Stone, we are looking at that. We've we've uh, we've been we've talked with Commissioner Kelly Davis as well on that, and with we're 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 waiting for our new licensing system with Brant and marketing. And so right now, Deputy Director Hocutt is looking into that at the different ranges and and looking at. Should there be fees if we look into this? Is that an option? Or should it be inclusive of somebody that holds one of our licensing and or a combination of those? So, yes, sir, we are absolutely looking into That's that. That's good to hear. Yes, sir. And we'll look, the committee will get into that later next year. Right. <laughs> Any other questions for us? Yes. Um, What's the process like when uh, after they sign up initially when they come a second time? Do they sign the waiver each time or just sort of check in? Oh uh, yes. So every time they come, uh, you still have to sign in on the uh, the tablets, whatever we have at the range. So you still have to sign in. I uh, generally do this so we can check the range pass cards. Like I said, if it's expired or it's been over a year since they've been back, I would do require them to rewatch the video just in case they forgot how things operate or if anything's changed. Any other questions from the commissioners? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on these ranges, obviously 100 yard range, do people just walk down there, do it, or do you got a golf carts, any things to help the transportation? How does that work? I uh, say so they are currently carrying their own targets down and then walking back. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from commissioners? Thanks for a great presentation. I think yeah. the video is well done. And heard a lot of information on like, citing and choosing ranges that I didn't know before. I thought it was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This time we'll take a five minute recess to take pictures and we'll be, Cam and I'll be right back in. Back in order. Everybody find a seat. And at this time I'll call on uh, Director Ingham for consideration of non game wildlife advisory, advisory committee appointments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My comments are in reference to Exhibit C in your package. Mr. Chairman, after consideration of the 11 candidates that were nominated, along with a review of the candidates during the Hinges Committee meeting yesterday, I recommend appointment of the following individuals to the North Carolina Non-Game Wildlife Advisory Committee as outlined in Exhibit C. First, Governor Affiliate Jeff Bean, North Carolina State Museum of Natural Sciences for reappointment. Dr. Michael Martin, North Carolina Department of Agriculture for a new appointment. Expert affiliate Michael Abney from Duke Energy as a reappointment. Dr. Joe Poston from Catawba College for a reappointment. At large affiliate Elaine Jordan from the Coastal Companies as a reappointment. At this time, I entertain a motion and a second for approval of Exhibit C, which will approve these uh, recommendations. So moved. moved. So good. A motion from Commissioner Craig, second by. Davis. Same time. Yeah. Kelly Davis. Are there any further comments? Questions? Hear none. All those in favor of approval of these uh, appointments? Uh, exhibit C. Senator say aye. 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 No. Motion carries. This time we'll call on Ben Solomon, our Assistant Chief of Land Acquisition Manager, to present two phase two projects. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners and staff. We have two phase twos to look at this morning. The first of which is the Dix Creek Tract, which is in Haywood County. It's a 166 acre tract at Cold Mountain Game Land. And the second phase two, exhibit D2, is the Gaskin Swamp Tract, which is 179 acres in Bertie County, adjacent to the Bertie County Game Land. Staff in the Land Acquisition and Property Committee recommend phase two approval to proceed with the acquisition of Exhibit D1 and Exhibit D2. So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second of approval of D1 and D2. All those in favor? Six five saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We'll now go forward to rulemaking and I'll call on Ashley Pepper. Present emergency and temporary rulemaking for CWD. Exhibit E. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recommend taking Exhibit E by itself, Exhibit F, G1, and G2 together, and Exhibits H through M together. Run that by me one more time. <laughs> I recommend taking Exhibit E by itself, Exhibits F, G1, and G2 together, and Exhibits H through M together. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Exhibit E is the emergency and temporary amendments to CWD surveillance area rule 10B0503, as described yesterday in the Committee of the Whole. These amendments prohibit the use of possession of substances and materials obtained from a hunter harvested deer in the primary and secondary surveillance areas. At this time, staff requests adoption of the emergency amendments to rule 15A and CAC 10B0503 and approval to notice text and open the public comment period for temporary amendments to this rule. This time I accept the motion and second for approval of Exhibit E. A motion to Commissioner second. Hall, second by Clifton. Ray, Ray Clifton. Any further comments? Yes, sir. I, I, I just, how in the world is enforcement going to handle that? Very careful. What's, what's the question? That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Any further questions or comment on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Exhibit E is adopted. I'll move forward with the consideration of Exhibit F, G1, and G2, Ashley. Thank you. There are two exhibits F and G that require commission action. Exhibit F, 10B0201, prohibited taking and manner of takes. 
incorporates a session law exceptions to the prohibition on possession and use of deer excretion as described in the Committee of the Whole. Exhibit G1 is the approved physical note and Exhibit G2 includes a proposed text for permanent rules for endangered, threatened, and special concern species. These species are being added or taken off of these lists as mentioned yesterday. At this time, staff requests approval to proceed with publishing the fiscal note and notice of text in the North Carolina Register, an opening to public comment period for 15A NCAC 0201 and 10I 0103 through 0105. This time I accept the motion to second for approval of exhibits F, G1, and G2. I have a motion by Commissioner Hall. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Zimmer. Are there any further comments or questions? On F, G1, or G2? Hearing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Exhibits are approved. Okay. Exhibits H, I, J, K, L, and M are proposed amendments and rules recommended by agency staff for final adoption as described yesterday. Exhibits H1, I1, H2, and I2 contain 23 at 10 C inland fishing and 10 B wildlife management rules with minor changes as part of the periodic review to provide clarification, remove outdated language, and bring them up to date with current practices. Exhibit J1 and J2 are for the proposed wildlife technician certification and eligibility rule 10H 1510. This rule will set standards for certification for those that work under the direct supervision of a WCA. Exhibit K1 and K2 are for the proposed amendments to the importation of wild animals and birds 10B0101 to align our language with that of the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's requirements on entry of aviation species. Exhibit L1 and L2 are for the proposed replacement cost rule 10A1502 that assigns a monetary value to certain native species. And lastly, exhibit M1 and M2 are for the proposed amendments to 10C0208. Spawning areas, changes include removing the fishing prohibitions on the Linville River and bypass channel around Lock and Dam number one and prohibiting fishing from March 1 to May 31 in three restored floodplain slows. At this time, staff requests adoption of these amendments to these rules. This time I accept a motion and a second for approval of exhibits H2, I2, J2, K, L2, and M2. So moved. A motion second. by Commissioner Wyndham. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Zimmer. Are there any further comments or questions? Any further debate? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion and second for these exhibits noted, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Exhibits approved. And move forward water safety rulemaking and call on Betsy Haywood, our water safety rules coordinator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, commissioners and visitors. As we discussed in the Boating Safety Committee meeting yesterday, August 17th, 2022, there are nine action items required for water safety rulemaking today. Mr. Chairman, may I suggest that we hold these for a single vote at the end? Yes, ma'am, that's Thank you. what our intent is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, exhibit N2 is final adoption of temporary rulemaking under 15A NCAC 10F.0305 for a temporary rule at Jenks Creek in the town of Sunset Beach in Brunswick County to mitigate navigation hazards until a dredging project there is completed this winter. And may I note that there is no plan to replace this with permanent rulemaking. Exhibit O2 is final adoption of a permanent rule under 10F.0310 at the town of Avon in Dare County to extend the no wake zone in Mill Creek into a small portion of Pamlico Sound to mitigate boating safety and re water recreation hazards in the shallow waters and blind curves that are there. Additionally, there are seven requests for notice of text to be published in the North Carolina Register with an open comment period and public hearing for the following permanent rule proposals. First, we have exhibit P1. This is under 10F.0314 New Hanover County in the city of Wilmington to extend the no wake zone in the navigation channel in part of Bradley Creek so that it extends from the US 76 bridge to the southeast ending at channel marker eight near the mouth 
to mitigate numerous boater safety hazards, which include a very narrow channel, shallow waters, and heavy vessel traffic. Along with P1, we have exhibit P2, which is adoption of a fiscal note that is required by the Office of State Budget and Management that shows financial costs to New Hanover County and to the state of North Carolina for this proposed rule. Exhibit Q. This is Wilkes County under 10F.0361 on behalf of the US Army Corps of Engineers at the W. Carr Scott Reservoir to extend two no wake zones to include entire coves where boating access areas are located and to list in the rule descriptions and addresses of all other no wake zones, marked swim areas and a safety zone near the dam. Exhibit R, Northampton and Warren counties. This is 10F.0336. Technical corrections to add into this rule descriptions and addresses of the new Odom boating access area on the Roanoke River in Jackson and the Stonehouse Timber Lodge Marina on Lake Gaston and Warren County. Exhibit S. Hamlico County under 10F.0326. These are technical corrections to add names and addresses of four boating access areas that are owned or operated by the WRC. Exhibit T, this is Montgomery County under 10F.0327, a technical correction to add the address of the Old North State Marina on Baden Lake. And finally, exhibit U, a technical correction to 15A NCAC 10F.0301 general provisions to remove language from this rule that limits the size of a safety zone where vessel access is prohibited by all except authorized personnel. Staff recommends commission adoption of exhibits N2, O2, P1, P2, Q, R, S, T, and U. I won't repeat that, but I'll ask for a motion to do make a motion. She just, well, Mr. She Chairman, just made. Yes, weren't sir. there some people who want to recuse themselves on P1 and P2? No, he's absent. He's absent. I'll sorry. make a motion. You got a motion. Second. Got a motion and a second. You got who that is? Yes. Okay. Are there any further discussion? All those in favor of approval of these exhibits as noted, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed likewise. <coughs> carries. They're all adopted. And at this time, I'll call on Dr. Thank Chair. You. Chair Schwartz. Yes, sir. Just a quick comment. I, I think we need to commend Betsy for coming in here and being and taking this boating safety stuff and presenting it in such a professional manner. It's always a pleasure to see you and thank you for being here. I agree. Yeah, thank you. Good call. Thank you. And at this time, I call on Dr. Sarah Schweitzer to present two conservation plans. Yeah, thank you very much. And good morning, commissioners and Mr. Chairman. I bring your attention to um, exhibits V1 and V2. These are for the conservation plans for the Henslow Sparrow and the Atlantic Pig Toe. The muscle. Um, staff have responded to reviews on these conservation plans from the NWAC, the Non-Game Wildlife Advisory Committee, um, Hinges Committee members, and the public. Uh, we discussed them yesterday during the Hinges Committee, and we have no further changes to the plans. So at this time, we request approval of these plans. Yeah, you have a... Uh... The recommendation, and I'll accept the motion a second for approval of exhibits V1 and V2, which will adopt these two conservation plans. Is there a motion? So moved. A motion from second. Craig and Alexander. Motion and a second. Any further discussions? Hearing none, all in favor of the approval of V1 and V2, these two conservation plans signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Motion carries. Exhibits approved. Thank you. Comments by the chairman. I've got just a few. First off, before I have my comments, I'll, uh, Commissioner Barry has a couple of comments he wants to make about an upcoming event. Yep. Now, so right okay. Uh, I want to uh, know several of you know that the Congressional Sports and Foundation has an event. It's at the Children's Winery. It's Wine Wheels and Wildlife. Lots of us attend this thing, and lots of you guys here have already signed up. But I'm telling you, it's a cool opportunity to see your legislators 
and uh, you know, been on some great events and see the great entertainment and also see who's who in the in the wildlife world. So, uh, but the biggest point I want to make that the Congressional Sports Foundation does is they're he they do all the heavy lifting congressionally uh, on major issues such as the Rawa issue that we're all dealing with right now. So, so that in itself is 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 enough reason to throw them a little change. So I just want to say, I'll be sending y'all a notice. Hope you can come and uh, we'll have some fun. We've already got about five tables sold. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Barry. What date um, is it, Tom? Uh, yeah, I got October the 12th, Wednesday. It's in Lexington at the uh, Children's Winery. In there. Thank you. And a couple of, one update item this morning, the Rules Review Commission approved, playing out quite quick, how. So the Rules Review Commission did approve the, uh, the 10C rules, the joint rules. They were approved as, we're, as we were sitting here. So those will move forward. Uh, they approved our 10D rules for game lands, but we've received 10 letters for uh, Goose Creek game lands. So that'll go straight to legislative review. So uh, hold on, we'll probably be having a, another another cycle meeting to approve uh, emergency and temporary rules. So there, there are, are rules on Goose Creek. They're in the uh, hunting the season this year. And right now they're they're actually talking about our 10C temporary rules uh, that, that y'all passed that Marine Fisheries Commission has expressed concern about. Yep, they, the Marine Fisheries Commission filed an objection yesterday afternoon at 435. And that's why Kerry and Christian are not present here today. We sent them over to the represent the Wildlife Commission, the Rules of the Commission. Mr. Chairman, that, yes, sir. that's after, if I, if, let me just get my thought process straight, but that's after they agreed on them. Isn't that correct? That was our understanding. Well, so I, I would say that this, the agreement on delineation that the chairman has is a different issue. Yep. Uh, these were rules that that we put in place to actually protect species when they're in our waters. So if a, right now, if a bluefish is in inland waters, uh, there is no protection, it, there's no size limit, there's no, there's no restrictions on the numbers that can be caught and they can all be sold. We, when we realized that oversight, we went and moved to ask y'all to, uh, to pass rules to protect those when they're in our, our waters. And so all the rules that they filed objection on are just in inland waters with the exception of one section that just clarifies the authority that y'all already have for uh, game fish that are game fish wherever they're found in coastal waters. Thank you for that clarification. Yes, sir. We were under the impression it was a clarification, but obviously we still have it. I'll leave it at that. Uh, every October meeting, actions of the commission last uh, meeting to move to, to have our meeting in, uh, Cherokee, look forward to that. Uh, we are, have already scheduled a meeting uh, with our, uh, Ashley has with our legislative, le Western legislators at Setzer to have them look at the hatchery uh, and explain our situation with the cost overruns there and potential help financially with that project. And we wanted them to get there. And uh, we've been trying to do this for a while, got beat out by a snowstorm, then a special session. And so finally, we've got an agreement to, have, to meet these legislators you know, on this trip. So we'll be asking a couple of you commissioners to join us, you know, for that meeting uh, while we're there in, in Cherokee. Uh, so we look forward to that. And uh, I have no further comment. I'll call on Cam Ingham if you have any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment again to, to recognize a few of our staff when I've got the opportunity from the Office of Communications, Marketing, Digital Engagement, for some national awards, not state awards, for some national awards that they have recently re recently received. First being Mike Zlotnicki. Mike is at the back back here. A lot of you see his writings in Wildlife in North Carolina Magazine and, and different publications. Mike's a, a great outdoorsman and great writer for us. Uh, Mike was recently uh, recognized, associate editor of, of our magazine, was recognized at the Outdoor Writers Association of America as a winner of their excellence in craft contest for an article he wrote that appeared in last year's September and October issue of our Wildlife in North Carolina magazine. Next, at a, at a recent Association for Conservation Information National Conference, the Wildlife in North Carolina magazine won first place for survival skills for kids that was written by Josh Leventhal there, sitting beside Mike there, 
congratulations, Josh. He's the editor of our magazine in the general interest article category. Next, uh, are you a bird or video? Uh, won first place in the best use of humor category. Uh, that was uh, uh, headed by Ryan Kinnamore. I don't think Ryan's in here. And Scott Anderson, who's right behind me here. Thank you, Scott. And congratulations on that award. And the agency's North Carolina Wildlife Update constituent newsletter won second place in the external newsletter category, which is headed up by Mindy Wharton, who works with several of our staff. Mindy at the back, back there, congratulations, Mindy, and great work. Uh, these are accolades are well-deserved, Mr. Chairman, and we are so fortunate to have such a skilled team with our marketing and engagement team, which is headed by Deputy Director Lisa Hocutt. So good job, Lisa. And fair. fair. <laughs> it definitely Had puts a, a good representation a on the Wildlife Commission, no question about it. Without and, a doubt. And that concludes my comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank okay. you. Any other business conduct comments? Hear none. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>